afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you uh, joining us for another Rush Generations lecture today on Wednesday, April 12, 2023. Uh, if you're in Chicago, I hope you are enjoying this beautiful weather that we're having today. Um, and my name is Kim, uh, and I am one of the program coordinators for Rush Generations. And this lecture is being brought to you by the Social Work and Community Health Department in Rush, or I'm sorry, uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Today's lecture is titled Colorectal Cancer Screening. And for this lecture, we are delighted to have one of our esteemed Rush colleagues sharing her expertise on this topic. Um, first, I want to begin by thanking today's lecture producer and technical support, Hannah Weitzman. Um, also, if you want to watch previous Rush Generations lectures, get notifications of new lectures and videos, please click the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you don't miss any information. Thank you to those of you who are joining over the phone as well as on YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube and have any questions for our speaker, please type them using the live chat button located in the bottom right of your screen. Um, your questions will be answered at the end of the lecture. And if, for those of you who are listening over the phone, there will be an opportunity at the end to unmute yourself and be able to ask questions for Dr. Lee. And now for our presenter today, uh, we have Dr. Selena Lee with us and she completed her medical training in California is her home state and continued on as a medical resident at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, then completed her subspecialty training in gastroenterology at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. She has made Chicago her home with her two sons, husband, and two dogs. Dr. Lee has been an attending physician at Rush University for almost a decade. And she says that she is camera shy, so uh, she apologizes for the old photo that she's using. <laughs> um, and at Rush, she really enjoys her role as a clinician educator, caring for both patients and training the next generation of physicians. Her primary interest within gastroenterology is in screening and surveillance for cancers and high-risk pre-malignant conditions. And she is also passionate about saving lives through educating patients on the importance and feasibility of early detection and therefore cure from previously deadly cancers. Dr. Lee, we are so excited to have you with us today um, presenting to our Rush Generations and community members. And I will hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you everyone for having me. I especially thank Rush Generations for the kind invitation. Um, I'm really glad to have so many callers already on the line. Um, and as Kimberly said, the, one of the things I'm most passionate about is talking about the ways in which we can save lives from cancers that were previously deadly, um, for which we know have great cure rates when detected early. And one of those cancers is colorectal cancer. Um, so right now I'm gonna just uh, transition to sharing my screen. Kimberly, let me know if there's any issues. You're able to see it? Okay. All good? Yes, that looks great. Okay, great. So um, one of the most important things to know about colorectal cancer screening is that it's not one size fits all. Everyone on this call has probably heard about colonoscopies, but it's not the only way to do it. And it's important to know your options. And if you do choose colonoscopy, how we can do it in the most optimal way possible. And to just get us started, I'd like to begin with a few myths and the facts behind those myths. Um, one of the myths that I hear the most is that I am not at risk because I have no family history. And in fact, most diagnoses of colorectal cancer are made in individuals that have no family history at all. So it's not protective just because there's no one in your family that has colorectal cancer. Another is that um, people would believe they're not at risk because they eat and 
and are very active, have, live a very healthy lifestyle. But in fact, diet and lifestyle, as much as it may reduce your risk of developing polyps and cancers, is not fully protective. And in fact, um, it's, it's minimally uh, protective, so much so that we don't necessarily recommend dietary changes for the sake of preventing cancer. Um, further, some people believe that just because they don't have symptoms, they are not someone that has cancer already. And that is because the most unappreciated symptom is that of feeling completely well and having no symptoms at all. Um, other people might say that they would take their chances because they will absolutely not have a colonoscopy. And what's important to understand is that colonoscopy is just one of many methods of screening. And if you, for whatever reason, don't want to undergo a colonoscopy, it doesn't mean that you can't get screened appropriately. And then finally, there are some people that might be open to having colonoscopies, but they have heard that the preparation is absolutely intolerable and don't think that they can go through with it. And I'm here to tell you that there have been a lot of advances to bowel preparation. Additionally, it's important to also continue to keep in mind that colorectal cancer, as commonly as it is being talked about, is still the third most common cancer in the United States. It affects men equally to women, affects one in 25 people, leading to 140,000 cases per year and up to 50,000 deaths per year. We do know what the precancerous lesion is, and that is an adenomatous, which is a particular kind of polyp. And we know that we can identify these polyps and take them out, thereby potentially preventing cancers from happening at all. Adenomas are very common, and about one in every third person screened will have adenomas. And that is why we take care to look for them when we do colonoscopies. Now, regarding risk, there are some risk factors that are modifiable and some that are non-modifiable. Um, as is obvious, if you have a family history of cancer um, or of polyps, or if you have another genetic uh, condition that predisposes you to cancer, those are the non-modifiable risk factors. But of the modifiable risk factors, that would include things like obesity, weight management, diet, activity levels, smoking, and alcohol consumption. And as you can see here, as much as you're having a family history of colorectal cancer may increase your risk of developing cancer, by two to three times that of the average population, you can see that also smoking increases your potential risk in the same magnitude. Um, and again, eating healthy is potentially protective, but not as much as not smoking or not having a family history. Other things, factors have been studied as well. And as you can see here, um, when looking at um, medical history or background um, habits and diet, um, while protective, it is really barely protective. So just because you eat a very high fiber or high um, or un unprocessed and natural diet does not mean that that decreases your risk of developing colorectal cancer that significantly. Now, as far as symptoms go, the typical symptoms that people think of um, that are true um, include rectal bleeding, having a change in your color or darkening of your stools, a change in your bowel habits, narrowing of your stools, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, anemia, constipation, or tenesmus, which is a term for spasming or pain in the rectum when having a bowel movement, and, then, and also loss of appetite. However, these are typically very late symptoms, and the most common symptom in somebody who has early colorectal cancer is no symptom at all. And that is why the mainstay of saving lives is screening, it's because you don't know that there's something growing and because it's such a common cancer, we screen everyone or recommend screening everyone over a certain age. Now, this graph depicts survival rates measured in um, increments of five years after the diagnosis. And as you can see, comparing um, people across gender, so whether you're male or female, um, and across ethnicities, the most important difference between survival rates is the stage of the cancer. So, for instance, if you have a cancer that, you know, in this graph is distant, but is metastatic or stage four, then the five-year survival rate is in the order of about 10 to 15 percent, whether you're male, female, and whether you're, um, and regardless of what ethnic group you belong to. However, if your cancer is diagnosed at an early stage, your survival rate in five years is as much as 90 percent. And again, it's whether you're male or female and no matter what ethnic group. And that is why it makes sense to catch cancer at an early stage. And when we talk about screening, there are three factors mainly to consider. The age of start, the method, and the interval between exams. 
as you may know, we started, we start screening now at an earlier age, whereas it was 50 years old before, now we start at the age of 45. And that's because the evidence had been mounting that colorectal cancer started to affect the cohort of people between age 45 and 50 um, in a significantly higher, um, uh, at a significantly higher rate. And so we've pushed it forward to the age of 45. Um, we previously also recommended that we stop at the age of 75. And so the general guidelines will say that we screen between 45 and 75, but the end date of screening is also very fluid. So I wouldn't necessarily say all people would stop at the age of 75. After the age of 75, it should be a case uh, by case decision made between yourself and your physician and taking into account your risk factors, your health status, and um, and your ability to tolerate further screening and even your own personal preference. Uh, there is definitely not a hard stop at the age of 75 is what I want to emphasize. And then the test method are variable. There are some that are considered invasive and some that are considered non-invasive and we'll go more into detail with each test. The interval between exams will vary depending on the test. For example, if you have a completely normal colonoscopy with no family history and a very good, clean, uh, high quality exam, the interval between exams can be as, as infrequently as every 10 years. Whereas if we use a stool-based um, test that looks for microscopic evidence of blood, the interval between exam is as frequent as once every, one, every year. As far as the tests that, um, that are available, uh, like I said, there are two, uh, you can split them up into those that are non-invasive and those that are invasive or those that detect cancer and those that detect pre-cancer. So what we have as far as tests that detect cancer um, are um, the uh, are stool-based tests, mainly two tests. One that detects microscopic evidence of blood, it's called the fecal immunohistochemical test, uh, replacing the fecal blood test um, in most cases. And it only requires one sample, you do it annually, and it's um, done under the assumption that an early cancer will, uh, will uh, excrete blood in the stool that can be detected through this test. Um, another test that you've probably seen a lot of commercials for on the television is the stool DNA test or otherwise known as the FIT DNA test. Um, this is a bit more costly and it won't detect polyps just like the, the uh, FIT test won't detect polyps. And because it's a bit newer, it's, uh, the interval is not quite certain, but Right now, the benchmark has been set at every three years. And the aim of this test is to detect either blood that is lost by a cancerous tumor or DNA that is um, shed by the cancerous tumor. Now, as far as the tests that detect uh, cancer and precancer, um, we have either a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a halfway colonoscopy, um, and CT colonography and colonoscopy. In some places, um, not in the United States, colon capsules are used. And also in rural areas, this is a double contrast variant enema um, for patients that don't have access to either CT or colonography. But generally speaking, at least at Rush, these are the tests that are used. Now, flexible sigmoidoscopy has uh, since been replaced by colonoscopy um, in any institution that has availability just because um, it is a better test that accesses the entire colon. And between CT colonoscopy Colonography and colonoscopy both will detect polyps, um, but CT colonography is going to be less sensitive because uh, it is just an image and it will detect polyps uh, greater than one centimeter, whereas a colonoscopy is a direct look with a camera so we can detect even polyps that are barely visible, less uh, at the order of one millimeter. A CT colonography does require that you drink the bowel prep or the purge that cleans out the colon. Um, but it is not invasive, and so you don't need sedation, there's no recovery time, um, and you would get this procedure every five years. In a colonoscopy, uh, we typically do it with sedation, but it's not absolute. Some people don't want to have any medication, and, and that's absolutely safe and fine. And like I said, it's a direct exam, so not only can we detect smaller polyps, we can also take biopsies and, and take out polyps in the same exam. And with a very, um, with a very clean adequate procedure, um, the intervals can be as, as infrequent as every 10 years. And this is the test of choice according to uh, the gastroenterology societies. 
That being said, amongst all the options, the best test is absolutely the test that gets done. And that is because we'd rather have a non-invasive test that is potentially less sensitive or um, potentially gives a, a false positive requiring for the follow-up than missing any cancer at all. Now, if you were to choose with your doctor's guidance, a colonoscopy, um, it's important to keep in mind there are three phases to the procedure. And the procedure phase, one in the middle here, is, is um, the, the part of the, uh, the process that most people think about. But I would argue that the day before the colonoscopy, the preparation phase is the most important one. And that's the one that you're in charge of as the patient. And that is because when we say that we can do a colonoscopy every 10 years or every five years, the interval is really dependent on the quality of the exam. And the quality of the exam is highly dependent on the quality of the bowel preparation. And in other words, that is how clean you're able to get your colon. Now, some of the myths around this process include having to be starved for days or a week before the procedure, or having to drink a whole gallon of terrible tasting fluid. Um, this is not untrue as far as the gallon goes because it is still used in some cases, but it is certainly not the only option. Whereas in truth, you really only need to start preparing the day before the procedure. And, um, and that would mean that you're gonna be mindful of what you eat. It doesn't mean that you can't eat at all. So for instance, the day before the procedure, I let my patients have a very hearty breakfast. And that can include something as hearty as a ham and cheese omelet, a tall sack of pancakes, or a steak. You can have an ice cream sundae without the, without the cherry. And that is because fiber is what really is difficult to clear out from the colon when you're trying to have a colonoscopy. And if you eat something without fiber, that's going to get cleaned up by the medications. And if you have a hearty breakfast throughout the rest of the day when you're supposed to be on the clear liquids, it'll make it a lot more tolerable and a lot easier to get through. Um, you have nothing to eat after midnight and then you're there for the procedure. So it can be a pretty, uh, it can be a lot less cumbersome of a process. And with regards to the bowel preparation, as you can see here, the medications are much different and there are many options that are better tasting and smaller in volume, even as small as six ounce doses. So. The smallest volume option that we have are two six ounce doses. And for perspective, that is about the same size as a generous restaurant pour of wine. So if you can imagine throwing back three shots or uh, throwing back a, a glass of wine, that's basically what you would be taking for your bowel preparation. Now you'll have to chase it with 30 ounces of water, but the medication itself is a very low volume. Now, if you can see the screen, that's fantastic. If not, I will try to describe it. Um, and this is to highlight the importance of the bowel preparation. Um, what's unique about this presentation is that by the end of it, if you can see the screen or if you can review the pictures afterwards, you're gonna be able to identify polyps and identify what is a good quality colonoscopy from the inside out, quite literally. So here we have a couple pictures of a colon, and these are really good um, pictures. These are really good, uh, uh, well-prepped colon, sorry. Um, they're clean. You can see the vasculature, the markings of the vessels along the walls of the colon. You can see the mucosa entirely. And you can, you can imagine that if you could see behind every fold, you'd be able to pick up polyps that are even really tiny and take them out. In contrast, these pictures show what we consider a poor preparation. So there's lumps and clumps of stool still in the mucosa. You can't see all the way around. There are definitely places where there's stool covering enough of the colon where you can conceivably miss polyps um, that are, you know, one, two, three centimeters in size or even a small cancerous tumor. And so for patients who end up with a, a preparation that is of this quality, we wouldn't feel comfortable saying this was okay and come back in X amount of years it would just have to be repeated because there's no guarantee you aren't missing a cancer. In contrast, this is a bit of a middle of the road type of preparation where you can see most of the colonic mucosa, but there are pools and puddles of stool in places that you can't clear. And this is because of the fiber. So this is why I was saying, if you're gonna cheat or if you're gonna have a breakfast, you need to have something with no fiber because as much as we can suck out the liquid stool or the semi-liquid stool, fiber cannot be cleared. 
And so even if you were able to suck out the stool um, in these pools, you can definitely miss big polyps. Um, for instance, this was a real life example. And um, when I unfortunately had to tell this patient to return in, you know, as soon as she could with a different kind of a preparation, underneath one of these pools of stool, I found a large carpet-like polyp that had cancer within it. And thankfully it was an early stage and she got cured of surgery, but it would absolutely have been missed um, if she didn't redo her colonoscopy. Now, you know, that those pictures that I just showed could have become, could have been considered fair because there was in between the poor prep and the good prep. Um, but, and sometimes fair is enough because when we say it's a fair prep, we mean we're able to see most things. We're not likely to miss anything that's um, greater than a centimeter, but if it's less than a centimeter, it may be missed. But we would have a patient with a fair preparation come back sooner than 10 years, so either three years or five years. And so in this picture, you can see that it's probably good enough. There's some puddles, they're pretty small. You can clear most things out. Um, and you could probably see polyps of this side. So these pictures are um, showing you polyps that are about um, seven millimeters, five, seven millimeters. But what about this polyp? This is a two to three millimeter polyp, and this would be easily covered by that quality of preparation. And in these pictures are other examples of uh, colons that we would also consider fair. And again, you don't see anything big, but here in the lower right-hand corner, you see this small polyp that would have been covered if this pool of stool was moved over just a little bit to the right. Now, here's a, a chance to test your skills if you're looking, okay? Um, this is a classic polyp. Um, I think most of you can identify where it is. Uh, if not, it's, it's here, it's right in the middle. And it is a, it's what we call a pedunculated polyp, meaning it's on a stalk. It's like a circular round grape-like lesion, um, very easy to see and, and easy to take out. However, not all polyps are like that. This is also a polyp and it's a lot more subtle, but if you look closely, you can, I bet you can probably see where the mucosa or the lining of the colon uh, is a little bit different in its, um, in its texture right up here. And when we inject underneath it, we can, we can show a more crisp border here. And so this is the same polyp, just with an injection of saline um, underneath the polyp. We lift it up and we can see the borders much more crisply. But as you can see, it's flat. It would be easy to miss if the preparation wasn't as good as it was. Here's another example of a polyp, this one in a fold, um, a bit lumpier, so easier to see. But again, if the preparation wasn't really good, it would be easy to miss. And in this case, I injected it with blue dye to lift it up closer and also to demarcate the, the borders. And this is something that we can resect um, while we're in the colon, doing the colonoscopy because we're able to identify. Another example here, can you see the polyp here? This is another flat polyp. So subtle because in certain angles, you're not really able to see how different it is from the surrounding mucosa, but you can see where the vessels end in the polyp. And so you can see that there's a sudden shift in the vascular markings, and that makes us uh, stop and pause and look a little bit harder, and we can indeed see an outline here. When we inject it with the dye, you can see the crisp edges and a, and a, a big polyp emerge. Similarly here, this is what we call an egg drop soup covering to this, these flat polyps. Um, and the, muco the mucus layer or the mucus cap helps us outline the borders of these polyps, which would otherwise be very difficult to see. So for instance, in, on the left here, you see the flat polyps outlined by the mucoid cap. And when they're washed off, when the mucus is washed off, you see this picture where if I didn't know that there were polyps there before, it might be very easy to miss because the change in texture from the colonic mucosa that's normal is very subtle right here. All right, and I think this is the final picture here. In this picture, I know I sometimes have a hard time finding where the polyp is again, um, but if you look closely, you can see some changes in vascular markings and some changes in the texture of the colon, uh, colonic mucosa, and again, Lifting it with blue dye, you can see this polyp emerge with really nice crisp margins. Um, and so I hope that if you're able to see these pictures or you can review them at a later time, you can 
be convinced that the bowel preparation is arguably the most important part of the procedure. Now, um, just to take home um, some main points here, uh, what I want you to really keep in mind is that colorectal cancer is very common. And the most modifiable and most important modifiable risk factors are smoking and screening, whether or not one gets screened. The most common early symptom of colorectal cancer is nothing at all. It is very, it is potentially preventable. Um, it's definitely curable if found in early stages. And the methods for bowel preparation have vastly improved. And there is no more, and there's much more to screening than colonoscopy. So if you're averse to getting a colonoscopy for any reason at all, please talk to your physician to talk about the different options. But ultimately, the best test is a test that gets done. I will take any questions that there are at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, for those of you who have called in through the Zoom uh, meeting, please feel free to unmute yourself by pressing star six. Um, and those of you who are listening on YouTube, you can type in your question in the chat box and we will get those to Dr. Lee. Um, there, there's one YouTube question that just came through and it says, are colon polyps caused by medications or diet? Thank you for that. Let me just make sure I'm not muted. Okay, thank you for that. Um, no, they are not caused by medications and diet has been implicated in increasing the risk of developing polyps especially diets that are high in saturated fats, low in fiber and highly processed. So having a diet that is um, grainy and unprocessed, high in fruit and vegetable fibers can potentially be protective, but it is not as protective as not smoking at, or, um, or getting screened or not having family history. So the protection of changing your diet is modest, but changing your diet to one that is not highly refined is generally good for cardiovascular health anyway. So we wouldn't not recommend it, but we wouldn't ask people to change their diets drastically for the sake of preventing polyps. Thank you for that clarification. Um, there's another YouTube comment that uh, came through and it says, what are the small white spots um, I, I think possibly on one of the um, particular images you showed? Small white spots. Um, if it's a, if it was on the image of the colon, there are a lot of pictures with like whitish, yellowish spots that was probably stool residue. Um, if you have, if you uh, want clarification on that, if that's not what you were referring to, please feel free to ask again. Also, there are spots in the mucosa that are really bright white. That would be, really be the reflection of the light. So on the end of the camera, there are three really high powered lights. And oftentimes um, the reflection will look like white spots. Okay. Um, so it's not in, it doesn't seem like, um, you know, when you're doing the colonoscopy that you're actually looking for like specific white spots. Um, no. Okay. The main goal of colonoscopy in screening is to look for cancers. And then a secondary goal is to look for polyps. But the white spots are likely either residual stool or the reflection from the light. Okay. Gotcha. Um, it looks like one of the callers has unmuted themselves. Um, if you have a question for Dr. Lee, please feel free to go ahead. Uh, doctor, can you grade uh, a, a, a mass, a non-polyp uh, mass, uh, during a biopsy that takes place uh, with colonoscopy? Can you put a grade on it, like the, the type uh, of mass, you know, whether it's metastasized and so forth? Is that possible? Good question. Um, no, it's not. So we, when we see a mass that looks malignant or cancerous, 
Um, mm -hmm. our, our job is to take the biopsies to prove that it is cancer, but we can't tell just by looking at it, whether it's early or whether it's metastasized. So after we confirm that it's cancer, um, or even before, if it looks like it's cancer enough, I would uh, immediately expedite the staging. And the staging process is how we can tell if it's localized or confined like an early cancer or if it's metastasized. And that involves getting a CAT scan of the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. So that is how we do uh, it. Okay. So that, that, state, that CT scan with contrast will be able to give uh, an idea of metastases or not. Exactly, yes. The biopsies really only tell us whether it's cancer or not, but it can't tell us if it's um, early or late stage. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any uh, comments on Lynch syndrome? Um, or is that, uh, maybe that's not appropriate now. Uh, well, well because absolutely, it's just a, it's a big topic. It's, is there anything in particular? Uh, well, uh, in relation to metastases, uh, a distant metastases, uh, when Lynch syndrome has been um, uh, very um, certain, you know, or, or as certain as you can be with a CT scan, uh, that, you know, I'm just wondering if a metastases with Lynch syndrome present would be any different than a metastasis without Lynch syndrome, or does that add an extra layer of concern? So Lynch syndrome um, is, and it depends a lot on the histology or what we see under the microscope, like tumors that are, mm -hmm. are um, found in patients who have Lynch syndrome are thought to be much more responsive to therapy. Um, oh. The treatment for metastatic disease in the setting of Lynch syndrome would depend probably more on the background health of the patient than on the Lynch syndrome. So if it was um, a young patient, which is oftentimes how Lynch syndrome is discovered, then mm -hmm. the treatment can be more, more aggressive. So I guess what I'm hearing from you is like, would we be more aggressive in someone who has Lynch syndrome? And I would say yes, but that's also with the caveat that it's usually because patients with Lynch syndrome and cancer are diagnosed at an earlier or like a background mm -hmm. healthier stage. So they may be able to withstand surgery on the liver for metastatic disease, whereas someone who was diagnosed that was later in life mm -hmm. may not, it may not make sense to put them through that. Um, I hope that answers you. Your oh, very much so. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, um, it, Dr. Lee, it looks like we received clarification on the uh, what the white spots might be. Um, I guess they were wondering whether or not that would be an indication of um, diverticulosis. Okay, no. So um, diverticulosis, and I'm looking at my slides here, do not have, uh, were not shown here. Um, I. I see them all the time. So I would have been happy to show you pictures of that. But generally on a colonoscopy, you would see dark spots. So if you see black spots um, or pockets, tunnels, that's what diverticulosis would look like, not the white spots. And I'm looking back at the slides here too, and just confirming that all the little white reflections, they were, they were, the, camera, um, they were the camera light reflections. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, I think I might see another caller unmuted. Um, if you would like to ask Dr. Lee a question, please feel free to do so. Um, we have a, another YouTube uh, question that came in that says, would taking supplements like uh, spirulina or chia seeds in oatmeal affect the results or affect the results of a Cologuard or fit test? No, it would not. Um, and uh, another question is, um, are there any insurance restrictions 
for um, getting the bowel prep, um, like are, are certain uh, um, preps not covered by insurance? And so, you know, folks need to do something alternate, um, you know, that might catch them off guard or something. Could you explain that a little bit, please? That's a, that's a great question and um, very frustrating potentially. Uh, insurers do differ as far as what they will cover. So when I talk about the small volume bowel preps, that's not universally covered, but the coverage has really gotten much better in the last um, half a decade. And so most people are able to get, get a small volume bowel prep through their insurance. Now, what the insurance specifically will cover amongst the different options will be different. And at Rush, we do um, have insurance information. So most of the time when we enter a prescription, we're able to tell that it's covered, but I never trust it 100%. So if you're in my office, I almost always will remind you that I'm sending this to your pharmacy and this is what I'm choosing because your insurance says it's okay. But if at the pharmacy they, take, they tell you to pay $100, then you can say no, give us a call and we can find out what your insurance will cover, if anything at all. So of these small volume bowel preps, there are four that are um, commonly prescribed that we uh, know will do a good enough job, as good a job as the classic gallon go lightly. And those are the four that we prescribe. There's additionally the availability of tablets. So for people who have an aversion to liquid medication, this is a really good option. Um, and it's been out for a couple of years now with good toleration of, amongst patients and good results as far as cleanliness. But I will warn you that the tablets are large. They're about the size of the end of your pinky finger um, and you have to take 24 of them. So it's not like an allergy pill. Um, and again, you flush it down with 30 ounces of water, just like you do with the small volume valve press. So from experience, most patients still prefer the small volume bowel prep, but the tablet is at least a good option. Um, but regarding the insurance, um, the short answer is it's not all covered. The coverage is better than it has been. And definitely you can ask your physician to help in finding what small volume option is covered by your particular insurance. As a word of caution, if you're getting a colonoscopy referral directly from your primary doctor, and you're not seeing a gastroenterologist in the office, which is totally fine. Open access colonoscopy, meaning you show up on the day of the procedure, just like you show up for the x-ray. That's completely, um, completely acceptable and a really efficient way to go about it. But just know that the primary doctors may not know all the different options. So you may have to be a bit more proactive and ask them, hey, can I have a small volume bowel prep? And if they don't know, they can find out from us what we would prescribe. Okay, yeah, thank you for that information. Um, and I know it is sometimes hard uh, in the office to know, you know, <laughs> every uh, different insurance policy and what might be covered. But um, yeah, it's great to know that you're at least, you know, available and able to problem solve if something does come up. Um, yeah, or, or they, if we're not they meeting with the They change all the time, which is, which is terribly frustrating for patients because they may have had it covered three years ago, but then the insurer decides to change their formulary. And now they're stuck with uh, something not covered. Yeah, that, that is terribly frustrating. Um, in uh, another question was in regards to um, the like the two days that you need for the um, like in preparation for the colonoscopy, um, when do folks need to stop eating like solid food and transition to that liquid diet? Good. So typically it's just the day before that is a clear liquid diet. But the day before for breakfast, I let my patients have a hearty breakfast. And this might depend on the specific physician. But the um, when we started transitioning our bowel preps to split dose instead of taking it all at once. There have been a lot of studies done in Europe that show that even if you were to eat all the way until 6 p.m., as long as it is a low residue diet the day before, uh, your colon will still be clean. So there's a lot of good, good evidence and good support for being able to eat at least a hearty breakfast the day before the procedure. And after that, 
you can have clear liquids all the way up until midnight. And remember that breakfast should be absolutely without fiber. So that's a ham and cheese omelet, that's bacon and eggs, scallops wrapped with bacon, whatever you wish, just nothing with fiber. And clear liquids after that will include anything that you can see through. So that's coffee and tea, juices, soda, you can have jello, sorbet, popsicles, and you can have that all the way until midnight. You'll start the preparation about five or 6 p.m. that evening. You take the first half of the medicine and then nothing to eat after midnight. And then the second part of the preparation you take in the early morning on the day of your procedure. So it's that split dose that cleans out the colon better now than it used to before. And that second dose that you take on the day of the procedure, you want to time that to be about five hours before you plan to leave the house for your procedure. So if you plan to leave the house at 10 a.m. for like a late morning procedure, you'll need to take that second dose at five. If you plan to leave the house at 7 a.m., then you will need to take that second dose at 2 a.m. Yeah, thank you for, um, you know, spelling all of that out. That That's really helpful to know. And um, I bet your patients like you for being able to say, have a, you know, big hearty meal, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> the breakfast before you start the prep. So, yeah. Um, I think it also, and this is not proven, but I do think from experience, it also helps with compliance. Because if we tell people you can't eat for two days, it's just not possible for some people. And and I also advise if you're going to cheat, don't cheat. But if you're going to cheat, cheat with a steak, cheat with an ice cream sandwich, but don't cheat with a salad or oatmeal because that feels healthy to people. And people think, well, I'm going to do something good for my colon and I'll eat a big salad. Well, I can see the salad the next day, but I won't be able to see the ice cream sandwich. Yeah, so even more so uh, having a, a meal that you may indulge in <laughs> as right. opposed to something healthy. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah. Um, well, I wanted to give one last opportunity to the callers if they wanted to unmute themselves to ask a question. Um, and we'll check the YouTube comments one last time. All right. Don't know if I'm seeing anything else right now. So um, I just want to extend a huge thank you to you, Dr. Lee. Um, really appreciate it hearing this all of this information that is, you know, very practical um, and informative too. I especially at the beginning loved what you were saying about what is modifiable versus non-modifiable um, when it comes to the um, risks of um, colorectal cancer and that the modifiable list was longer than the non-modifiable one. So um, just gives us, you know, feeling of control and um, knowing how best to uh, take care of, of our health. So thank you so much for your time today. And we would love to have you back with Rush Generations at any time. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be here and, and I'm glad to share this information. Please uh, reach out if there's any other questions. I'm happy to answer and talk more about this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, yes, our... I have a question. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, please feel free to go ahead. Um, is uh, fecal incontinence, is that a sign of uh, colon cancer? Because I know a lot of older people, they have a very incontinent fecal. So it's not a classic symptom of colon cancer, but if it's fecal incontinence because uh, your bowel habits have changed, they've become, you've become significantly more constipated, then it is something that needs to be investigated if you haven't had a colonoscopy in some time. So whether it's not a direct symptom of colon cancer, like I said, the most common symptom is nothing at all, but it is something that, um, that I would recommend bringing, uh, bringing to your physician so that they can do an evaluation and help you with that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much again for having me on. It was totally my pleasure to be here.
I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was, I was muted there, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much again, and hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. All right, so our final portion of today's lecture is our review of the upcoming Rush Generation um, classes and workshops. So, oh, let me go back to where that's starting. All right. So, um, Starting next Wednesday, we have our Tai Chi for arthritis and fall prevention. And this is uh, a class that you can join us from the comfort of your own home. And it will be a 16 session exercise program that focuses on relieving pain, reducing stress, and improving quality of life. Uh, results of participation in this course show an up to 70% decrease in the overall occurrence of falls, improved balance, significant pain relief, and less stiffness, as well as better ability to manage daily living. Um, so this will take place every Wednesday and Friday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, space is limited in this class, so please register by calling our 800 number if you're interested in participating. Next is our Health Legacy Program for Women, which is a free six-week workshop designed for women of color wanting to make lifestyle changes for themselves as well as their families by learning to eat healthy, lose weight, and improve their overall health and wellness. So we would love to have you join us for fun exercise, nutrition guidance, and health education in a supportive environment. And this helps to create a legacy for lifelong health for you, as well as your family. So the first session um, of this is uh, going to be April 13th um, and running through May 25th two days a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. And this will also take place virtually. And registration is required, so please call our 800 number to get more information or to register. And we are also excited to be able to offer our Health Legacy Program for Women in Spanish. And this will take place during the uh, same days of the week and during the same time. Um, so if you or anyone you know would be interested in participating in this program, please feel free to call our 800 number. Next is our Walk With Ease Structured Walking Group. Uh, this is a, an enhanced program that is offered through the Arthritis Foundation and participants will meet three times a week at the Garfield Park Conservatory with a certified Walk With Ease facilitator, and everyone will um, then walk together. Uh, these walks are at your own pace and can range from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, individuals with arthritis, osteoporosis, chronic pain or other conditions are encouraged to participate. However, you don't need any kind of condition to, um, to join. We um, just always welcome anyone who wants to connect with others and become more uh, active. Um, our next um, program will take place uh, starting today. Um, it actually started when this lecture did at 1 p.m. and will run Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 1 p.m. till 2.30 p.m. Uh, the deadline for registration will be coming up on the 16th of April, so be sure to um, uh, call us to get registered if you would like to join. Next is our Take Charge of Your Health, and this is offered in Spanish. Um, it started yesterday, April 11th, and will run until May 23rd. And this is from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this workshop is focusing on self-management 
and uh, is designed for people who have one or more chronic health conditions um, where people learn to, how to build skills and gain, gain confidence in managing their health and leading an active, fulfilling life. This workshop is uh, free and will run for the, the six weeks and will cover coping with pain, fatigue, isolation, communicating with family, friends, and health professionals, practicing good nutrition, evaluating new treatment options, and working on goal setting and problem solving. Registration is required, um, so please call our 800 number if you would like to participate. And we are also offering the same program, the Take Charge of Your Health um, on, for English speakers. And this is every Friday starting March 5th and running through June 16th from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And this will be offered virtually. We are also going to um, start our Learning to Live Well with Chronic Pain workshop again. Um, this is a six week workshop for people living with chronic pain and participants engage in discussions and skill building activities to better cope with day-to-day -day management of chronic pain. All sessions incorporate an exercise element and strategies for medication management, pacing activity, and rest. And our um, the start date of our next pro of our next workshop will be May 8th, and that will run from 2 p.m. until 4:30 p.m. And this will be virtually by Zoom. Um, in regards to our support groups, we want to remind you that we have our diabetes education and support group that meets every third Thursday of the month from 2 p.m. until 3 p.m. Central Time. The next session will be next Thursday, April 20th, and registration is required, so please call our 800 number to attend that group. Next is our Senior Connections Friendly Caller Program, and this is uh, and um, this is intended for uh, folks who may be living alone or feeling lonely um, or just interested in um, social interaction on a regular basis. And um, this program ha is, um, has trained um, uh, people who reach out to older adults for weekly calls just for a friendly conversation. All of the calls are confidential and your information is protected. Our uh, volunteers are encouraged to make referrals if anything is uh, comes up during your conversation um, that one of our programs might be helpful. Um, so if you would like to be connected with one of those uh, friendly caller volunteers, please call our 800 number. And we are continuing to um, offer our Rush Caring for Caregivers program. Uh, this is for um, those who are caring for older adults that are 60 and over. And uh, it, as part of participating in this program, you'll work with professionals to figure out how to help, um, figure out how the help you need to care for someone um, and get personalized education and support, as well as building an effective team and create plans uh, that work for everyone involved. Um, so for more information or to request an assessment, please call our um, number at 312-563-0352. And we're uh, also continuing to promote our older adult home modification program. And this is designed for uh, older adults to work with community and health professionals so that they can learn how to gain additional support with the goal of continuing to live at home safely. Um, so please call us to learn more about this program at 312-942. 
And lastly is our Shalman Senior Voices Program. And this program aims to empower older adults to discuss what matters most to them as they age. And uh, this information is important for people to share with your loved ones as well as your physicians. Um, so we would love to hear from you. Um, so please consider sharing your wisdom and um, what matters most to you as you're aging by uh, scanning the QR code here or by typing in the website address on this slide and follow the prompts for recording a story. And our next lecture will be next Wednesday, April 19th at 1 p.m. and that will be on complementary medicine. So we hope to see you at our next lecture. And lastly, as a disclaimer, um, this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Please never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions that come up after the lecture, please ask your primary care doctor about them. And on the screen, we have our 800 number, which is 800-757-0202. And this is the best way to get in touch with us. Um, if you have any questions about our classes and workshops, um, or if you have um, you know, any other questions about Rush Generations, becoming a member, we would just love to hear from you. Thank you so much for your time today, and I hope you take care. Bye-bye.